Hello everyone and welcome to our first webinar for today. I am Mohammed Al Zajali, petroleum engineering student at University of Oklahoma, and I will be your moderator for this amazing webinar. Our webinar today is about introduction to subsea engineering, which will be presented by engineer Mustafa Mahmoud. Engineer Mustafa Mahmoud is a lead subsea engineer at Shell Egypt Subsea Controller, TWI, Aberdeen, UK. Engineer, Engineer Mustafa has over 11 years experience in oil and gas industry, subsea sector working in operation, contractor and services company, specialist in subsea IMR, marine vessel diving, diving and ROV project management, subsea inspection, subsea surveys, offshore uh, cathodic protection system, GIS and AIMS applications. It's our pleasure to have you today, Engineer Mustafa, and the mic is definitely yours. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, we'll talk uh, about an introduction uh, to subsea engineering. Uh, but before I start, this uh, not enough at all to know about the subsea, as it's a huge branch of science. But I'm just giving you a snapshots or a brainstorming so you know exactly what you are interested in. Uh, do you like a certain topic? But definitely you will need a lot of time and invest more time to read about it and to be specialized in. So uh, accordingly, I put our agenda to satisfy this point, to give you like snapshots about everything in uh, the subsea. So uh, our agenda will be as follow. We'll have a brief history about the oil production in the subsea. When was the first commercial well? When was the first subsea development, etc. And then we'll talk about the subsea engineering. What is the subsea engineering? And what's the focus area of the subsea engineering? And then we'll talk about the subsea field architecture. What, how we arrange the subsea blocks on the seabed, what is the field layout, what's the type of this arrangement. And then we'll talk about the mechanism of this blocks itself. Uh, we have subsea production system and the subsea distribution system. We'll talk about each and every uh, item of this block and the subsea structure separately under those, to this, uh, under those two umbrellas. And then we'll talk about the subsea operation, uh, the inspection and maintenance and repair, the IMR, and the ROV and diving operation. Last thing we will talk about today is where are we in terms of the subsea and where we are going in the future and the development we need. So uh, a brief history first. So uh, in 1857 was the first commercial oil well, and this is, was in Romania. In uh, 1859 was the start of the U.S. oil industry. And in 1890 was the first of development, and it was in two uh, places. One was in Baku and the other one was in California. In uh, 1891, the first drilled submerged well ever, and this was in Ohio. In 1932, the first jacket structure, and it was in California. Before, we used to have the jackets made from wood. In 1937, was the first use of a flexible platform to, do, to develop 14 meter well. And this was in Louisiana. 1947 was the first out of sight offshore platform. The first platform we cannot see with our eyes is, is deep in the ocean and uh, in 1966 the first Norwe Norwegian sea development in 1970 we, uh, we installed 40 pipelines in the North Sea and in 1980s which is our concern today we start the first subsea development field in North Sea so as you see the subsea Engineering is a kind of new science, just to start 80s in the last centuries. But when we go further together, you will find that it has a great technologies and a lot of investment in this sector of the oil and gas. So 
I prefer first to know the, the world map for the uh, subsea, to know the depths that we are used to work in right now. Uh, in North Sea, which you start to work on, which is well, the, the depths is the subsea field depth is now is from 70 uh, to 120 meter. If we go to the uh, Gulf of Mexico, we can work up to 3000 meter. In Brazil, we, we can work up to 1200 meter. In Africa, we work to 500 meter. In, um, in, in, in Indonesia, we work up to 2000 meter. In India and Oman, we work up to 3,200 3, meter depths. And in Middle East, we have a lot of uh, explored well, uh, subsea wells, produced gas, and we work from depths from 1,000 meter to 2,000 meter depths in all the uh, Mediterranean section in the Middle East. This is our the map of the subsea fields worldwide. If you can see, almost everywhere we're trying to explore new depths, and we're trying to uh, get the gases and the oil from uh, higher depths than before. Okay, so what is the subsea engineering? When we heard the term subsea engineering, we have a small definition. We should keep it in our mind. And then we will have this uh, formal definition. The subsea engineering is the science that take care of production of the oil and gas safely to transfer it to the shoreline or the facility line. So we can represent this by it's a multidisciplinary field that's broadly responsible for the control and direct flow of oil and gas from deep marine wells. The scope of this engineering field includes all the hardware, controls, umbilicals, pipeline, and interfaces with host production facilities. So the subsea engineering focus on the underwater issues of the oil and gas and how we can how we're gonna solve these issues. So the industry now is growing more depths, as we mentioned before, and had a new completely solutions for the new requirements. This by chart is tell you what's the focus or what's the, 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 the divisioning uh, in the subsea. We have the well interface, we have the trees, we have the manifolds, we have the pipeline, we have the risers, we have the controls, we have the installation, and we take care about each and every part of this uh, division and all the associated items around it, right? So we know now the subsea is the structure and the science that take care of the production and oil and gas to bring it from this uh, under the seabed towards the processing facilities on the shore. So uh, how are we gonna build this? And uh, what the consideration we should consider when we build this? Like what the architecture and what the field layout for this? Uh, some consideration and factor we should consider about or think about it when we start developing any uh, subsea field. What the water depths that I will be working on? Is this a green field or a brown field? It's existing ex expert or I will tie back with a facility. What is the step out distances? Where, are, where, are, where is my exploration and where I want to deliver it? The type of the compilation and the field life. Do I need this field for three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, based on your production? What is the customer preferences? The flow assurance techniques I will use, any environmental impact. And last thing is the money. What is the capital expenses needed to build up this field? And what will be the operational cost or operational expenses to build up this field? This is two items, or the last, this last items should be well considered when you uh, build up any 
uh, subsea project or any project in the oil and gas. So the field layout, mainly we have two types of field layout, the dry tree system and the wet tree system. The dry tree system is I, I just have my well in the subsea and then the Christmas tree is above the water. It could be on a platform, it could be on a FIPSU, it, it could be in anything, but the subsea or the subsea structures, the subsea Christmas tree and the subsea structure is not on the seabed. The other thing is the wet tree system, which is you have your subsea uh, tree and the manifold and everything sitting on the seabed. And you connect this together, you have the connection together to transfer this production from the wellhead to the processing facility. Okay, so what's the type of the feed layout? First, we should know that the field layout determine which type of structure we will use in this field. We have mainly four types of field layout. Satellite layout, cluster layout, template layout, and the daisy chain layout. We will talk about each and every one of them individually and know when exactly we can use this layout and when we use the different layout and what we actually do in the reality. The first type is the satellite layout. The satellite layout, when you have individual Christmas tree connected with a single well and flow line to transfer the target to the nearest manifold. If you can see here in the picture, you can find the Christmas tree here and here, and it has a different connection and different flow line with a different jumper to the next manifold. We use this technique when we have long distance between the well. I have three wells and there is a long distancing between the well, so I need to connect them together to a nearest manifold to transfer the production to the shoot. And by the way, guys, we'll describe what is the manifold, what is the Christmas tree, and uh, how we operate them, and all of this is coming. We just, I need you to, Im to imagine first the field layout, and then we will describe in details each and every item of these. So the problem with this is it's an expensive approach because every Christmas tree and every well have uh, a separate feeding system hydraulic, uh, electronic, chemicals, everything. And, uh, but to give you uh, a best use of your uh, reservoir. If I put this well here, this is, will give me better drilling and I will reach uh, a better area of my reservoir so I can get uh, uh, highest production uh, and uh, uh, use uh, the, the, the pressure of the reservoir to produce easily. So the first way, uh, the first field layout is the satellite layout. Uh, the second one is the template layout, where we have a subsea Christmas tree grouped side by side under one template and production can be transferred to the shore. So it's all in all. I have here one, two, three, four Christmas tree grouped together and uh, the four wells is, is sitting above four wellheads and then you have you can transfer direct you don't need a manifold you can transfer direct as you can see in the other picture you can transfer direct the production from this uh, uh, template uh, christmas tree to the uh, uh, processing facility directly but this is allow you to have two wells uh, or more under the same template the other uh, advantage is it saves you a lot of time and money in the fabrication and installation because I have one feeding system, I don't need manifold, so I reduce it what I need to build up. But in the operation, it will give you some difficulties when you have the ROV operation because of the narrow area, the ROV will not be allowed, will not be able to go like in here and open this valve and do the line operation. The, the things we'll talk about later on uh we will know uh why 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 we need the rov operation and why this is a disadvantage the third thing is it's the cluster layout 
This is where we have a subsea Christmas tree grouped closely in a central location. Uh, this is allow us uh, to have one feeding system for the whole, for the uh, group, and as well, it, uh, production can be transferred in one pipeline or a manifold. Here, you can find the wells. The cluster well is in here, and the connection directly to the manifold for cluster wells and connection direct to the manifold and transfer through plates to one uh, production line to the shore, right? Third thing is the daisy layout. The subsea Christmas tree is spread, is spread it out over a wide area, but it's connected together with a sequence to allow us uh, the usage of one gathering line. Like I have uh, 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 many wells, I arrange it in a sequence, in a certain sequence. It's like a daisy chain sequence. This is the sequence I arrange it accordingly. To have at the end, one gathering or one trunk line is getting the production from the wells and transfer it directly to the production facility. Uh, it's better to use it for two wells only. Uh, if you have more, you tend to have a manifold to connect the, uh, the other production. Uh, it saves you money and time, and it uses one feeding system for the whole chain. So what we actually do in the reality is not the first one, it's not the second one, it's not the satellite well, it's not the template well, it's not the cluster well. We actually do a mix of everything. So any developed uh, subsea field, you will find that it's a combination of everything and every type of this layout we talk about. So you'll have the daisy chain, you'll have the uh, cluster, you'll have the template, you'll have uh, the, the satellite well, and then you connect them all together to produce your production. Uh, the first, the second picture here, it show you a real uh, orientation of wells and the feeding system of these wells. So if we look here, these are guys of the Christmas tree. So we have here the Christmas tree connected with a small jumper and this jumper is connected with a flow line and this flow line connected to another plat. Plat is pipeline end terminal and from this split, we have another jumper to connect them to the manifold. And this manifold is connected to another plate to the gathering line or the expert line to drive all of the production to the shore. So if we can see, we'll find all the type of wells in this. You can see here as well, the umbilical termination assembly and the, is the, the uh, uh, SDAs, the subsea distribution units, to uh, allow you to control this Christmas tree and to distribute chemicals, electrical and uh, uh, chemical uh, injections. And uh, the umbilical which is carry this uh, signals and electrical and hydraulic to the Christmas tree and the manifolds. Right? So uh, we talk about the field layout and we talk about the uh, production and how we transfer the uh, and how we transfer the the uh, production from uh, wellhead till the shore line and what are the field layout. So now we need to understand more what is the subsea system. The things we've been talking about of the beginning of this presentation. What is the Christmas tree? What is the wellhead? What is the manifold? What is the plat? We'll talk about this now. So the subsea system mainly divide into two things, subsea production system and subsea distribution system. We'll talk first about the subsea production system. The full subsea production system in any field or any development field worldwide is consists of the following building blocks. Wellhead, subsea tree, manifolds, and then 
pipeline systems. The pipeline system consists of spools and jumpers, risers, infield flow lines, and gathering lines. Now, let's talk about each and every building block of these and see how we operate them and how we install them, which will give us a better idea when we arrange them together in the field layout. So, the subsea production system, the Christmas tree and the wellhead. What is the subsea tree and what is the subsea wellhead? The subsea wellhead, simply, it's a primary foundation structure for hanging completion casing and enable installation of the subsea tree. So when the drilling team finish, they bought this wellhead, which is a primary foundation, to allow me to put my Christmas tree as a production, subsea production engineer, or as a subsea engineer, uh, to put my Christmas tree to be able to transfer the production. So what is the subsea tree? It's a group of valves and a spool used to control, regulate, and isolate production fluid from the well. So it's typically, this is the Christmas tree. Whatever is uh, the Christmas tree you'll see in the future, and whatever, is, uh, how uh, difficult and how complicated it becomes, it's that simple. A group of bulbs and spools. Valve, this is a valve, and this is a spool allow you to transfer the production. Right? So we have two types, mainly in the subsea, which is the uh, vertical Christmas tree and the horizontal Christmas tree. The vertical Christmas tree, as you can see here, it gives you uh, some ideas about the why we need the ROV. If you can see here, this is our uh, ROV uh, uh, section. It's friendly to ROV. It allows you to open the master valve. It allows you to, to open the annulus master valve. It allows you to close the valve. All of this is ROV panel to allow the ROV to do some operation to the Christmas tree. We'll know exactly after seconds what is the ROV. So how we install it? We will watch this video together. It's a three minutes video. It show you, shows you how we install the structure to the, uh, the subsea and how the R what is the ROV. It will show you actually a video for this ROV and uh, we'll talk about it later and be in details and what's the type and everything but it will make you visualize more what is the rov so let's watch this video together and then we'll back after as you see here there is a crane line carry this christmas tree and transfer it to the seabed you see here an umbilical this umbilical is for the rov These are our ROV, remote operating vehicle, some thrusters and cameras. It's your eye on the subsea. The crane now is go to the suction bar or the wellhead, install the Christmas tree. This is like give you a profile from inside. You don't see this in the reality, but I'm trying to give you an uh, idea what's, ha what's happening inside and how we uh, uh, install the Christmas tree to make sure it's, everything is okay. So now the Christmas tree is installed. The ROV now will go. remove the uh, blockage for the uh, electrical connections to connect the flying lead, the hydraulic and electronic flying leads.
This ROV is controlled from the vessel uh, in the control room, people is sitting and they do have like joystick and play with it just to make this ROV fly and make this arms that remove uh, this uh, blocks. Uh, it's like simulation, they really see this and the ROV is, uh, cameras is their eyes and they start to uh, unscrew everything to make sure is everything okay. Here is the ROV arm. This is a better better view. He will unscrew this now. We'll unscrew this and secure it here. We'll do the same for the other one. We'll start to open the bulb. The bulb is opening. And then the crane is removed this part. And now your Christmas tree is ready to use. So, I hope this video give you an imagination of what is the ROV is and what is the Christmas tree. In the previous uh, video, uh, just to know the scale of the things that we are working with, this is the Christmas tree and this is the average worker, average guy. To know the scale of the things that we are working with, right? Second thing is in the building blocks is the manifold. We divide the manifolds into two types, subsea production manifolds and subsea injection manifold. The subsea production manifold is a subsea structure containing bulbs, pipe work, and it's designed to combine the fluid for one or more subsea production Christmas tree to one or more expert line. And the other type is the subsea injection manifold and it's a subsea structure containing as well bulb and pipe work designed to distribute injection fluid for one or more injection line to one or more Christmas tree. So this is the definition of the usage of the manifold. What's the type of each and every manifold? We have three types of the manifold. Template manifold, like the template we heard about, cluster manifold, and the pipeline end manifold, the plan. The template manifold, it's a drill through structure designed to house multiple subsea Christmas tree. You can see it here in this picture. The other one is the cluster manifold. It's a standalone structure designed to direct the fluid from multiple Christmas tree placed around to one or two gathering line. The last one is the plum. We'll see a picture for the plum which is the pipeline in the manifold. And it's a simple version of the cluster manifold, but you use it for two or more, uh, not more than three uh, Christmas tree around. These are the plan. This is a real plan. And this is our the manifold. And this is our, the suction pile of the plan. This is our, the, sorry, the foundation of the plan, which is uh, put in the seabed. And this is, the manifold, this is the pipe work, and inside you can see the valves that operate all of this. Again, we'll see another video to show us how we install the manifold and uh, uh, show us as well uh, the rule of the ROV and the rule of the crane. Uh, this video is, is, is beginning earlier than the last one. The structure here is in the heavy uh, uh, 
crinage vessel, and the crane here it will carry this structure and put it, launch it subsea from this direction, and then go to the seabed, unscrew and opening the valve, and starting the operation. All right? Uh, this is something to remember, guys, in your future career. We are not doing any uh, craneage service without lifting a plan. So as a HSC part, we do a lifting plan. Uh, how we're going to put this slings and uh, the, the, the tonnage of this platform and the tonnage of the crane, where we will uh, install it. And the golden rule is we will never walk under uh, loads. If we have any crinage uh, activities, we, we stay away like this people, right? We see the video together. This is the same as the last one. There is a lifting supervisor watching all the operation to make sure that all the people is safe. Remember, we need to produce our oil and gas safe. This is our golden, golden rules. You see, the ROV now is watching the downing operation, there is ROV here, and the umbilical is here, and another ROV watching, the ROV here is watching. You see, guys, we call this as a guided post. This is the ROV, and there is another one. This guided post, it allow me to fix uh, my foundation or my structure in, in exactly the point that I want to fix it in. So, uh, because no, it's, it's, it's unmanned operation. The ROV is doing everything. So we need to facilitate the ROV work. So we bought this two guide, guide boost and the ROV is pushing a little bit till this guide boost, right? It will give you now a view from the other side to see it. Now it's lowering the manifold. You will uh, remove the slings. You will do this for the four. The crane is removing the slings from the subsea to the vessel. You see the ROV arm? This is to pull the guide. In some operation, we leave, we leave it. In some operation, we leave it. So when we do the decommissioning in the future, it will be easy uh, to decommiss or to remove the structure from the subsea. So in some operation, we leave the guide post. But in this operation, they remove the guide post. Sorry.
we install it now. The, you see it and you see the ROV and how he's executing the work. Just one second, okay. The third item we talk about in the uh, subsea production system was the pipeline system. Before I start this, I need to tell you something. The pipeline engineering is a huge branch of science. Uh, every and each, each and every single details, they do have a specialist to do it. So uh, we calculate choosing the size, the sizing of the pipeline. We have engineers to do that. Um, the, the, the pipeline operation, the flow in the pipeline. So what I'm giving you today is just a very high, high level of the pipeline and the type of the pipeline that we use offshore, right? So uh, what is the pipeline system? The pipeline system is the building blocks that provide a means for transportation to and from wells to the expert line. So what are the pipeline types or the technologies? We have the standard pipeline, uh, we have the pipe in pipe, we have the bundle pipeline, we have the piggybacked pipeline, we have the composite pipeline, and we have the flexible pipeline. We'll talk individually about each and every type of these, right? So what is the pipeline or the standard pipeline? The standard pipeline is the normal pipeline you see which is this, right? And it's normally fabricated from carbon steel or corrosion resistance alloys. And uh, this is the most common uh, pipeline we used in the offshore. We have another type, which is the pipe and pipe. Uh, it's a small pipe inserted with another pipeline. We usually use this near shore on, and the shoreline because of the probability of the third party damages to the actual or the pipeline that carry your target. And as well, because it's a severe corrosive area. You have here your inner pipeline and you have an annulus and you have your outer pipeline. The second type is the bundle pipeline. It's a several lines, several lines as we can see, contained uh, within an outer or carrier pipeline. This pipeline consists of expert line, injection line, electrical signals, and sometimes umbilicals. This, the annulus between this is filled with uh, pressurized nitrogen, and then we flow it. This type is, is, is a wonderful type. It saves you a lot of money, but it's a nightmare when you commiss or you do you the commission for your field after you finish uh, production. The third or the fourth one is the piggyback pipeline. It's a smaller line connected to a larger line. This piggyback line connect this huge line. Uh, usually I use uh, this as a, 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 a chemical injection or a communication line for the main line. The next one is the thermoplastic composite pipeline. This is still a concept, it's an R&D. We don't have any field developed using this. And the last one is the flexible pipeline. The flexible pipeline is the, the most, the second most common used pipeline in the offshore oil, uh, offshore oil field because of many things. It's uh, highly fatigue tolerant. It's uh, for the thermal expansion, it can absorb it. Uh, it the geometry of the field it doesn't really matter with this. Uh, cheaper, it's, it's a very good one. So the flexible is a highly fatigue tolerant lines, but it's limited with 130 degree of production, and it can never be more than 20 inch with a low, low pressure as well production. So what's the component of the flexible line? We have here the external shift, and then we have the tensile aroma, and we have here the pressure aroma, and we have internal chest. The internal and external chest usually is a polymers. And then the caracas, which is a stainless steel, 
It's so it's it's not corrode easily. In the pipeline system, we talk about spools and jumper. And at the beginning, I told you about the jumpers and the connection from the, the Christmas tree to the plate, the pipeline end template with the jumper. So what is the jumpers? And what is the spools? What is the difference? The spools and jumpers are used to provide short distance connection. And it, we use them interchangeably with the overlaps. The jumpers tends to be flexible line when we used it to connect wellhead to a manifold. But this is not for 100%. Sometimes we use rigid jumpers for uh, connection between wellhead and manifold. And sometimes we use flexibles. And the spool tend to be rigid and connect the pipeline to rise. And vice versa as well, it's not 100%. Both, we use them both just to accommodate the thermal expansion of the pipeline itself. And the shapes is vary. It can be L shape, M shape, U shape, Z shape. The, the shapes of the manifold, it depends on the meter, uh, metrology of the field itself and how I gonna uh, install this. I'll show you now video for the uh, installation of production jumper. Uh, it's a very nice one, by the way. We saw, we, you saw that we already installed this manifold, right? So I need, after I install the manifold, I need to retrieve the high pressure caps. We install the temporary protection caps. I remove the high protection cap from the Christmas tree as well. We install a temporary protection cap. This is the barge. This is the barge. And I left the production jumpers from the barge. I start to lower it to the seabed. When it's lowered, now the ROV is waiting for, for a subsea. You see the ROV is controlling the operation. The jumper is reaching the, the end. So I have the landing end here, number one. And we have another landing end, which is the manifold here. Here is the Christmas tree, and here is the manifold. This is what we call this science to how to install this. It's called metrology. We do surveys and uh, do some uh, techniques to uh, simulate this before we send uh, the barge to this location to install the jumper. So that we have here the two uh, landing ends. The ROV start do the work. The arm here is removing the shackles. We'll do this in the other end as well. Then we will retrieve the lifting frame. The ROV now is making the connection. He removed the protection cap and made the connection. The cap has been removed. We have something called multi-purposes basket. This basket, we installed it before the start of the job. We bought all the tools that we will need. And as well, we use it as a storage. If we want to retrieve something, remo remove something, we retrieve it and we remove it. Then he removed the protection cap from the manifold from the other side. And then we'll go to the, to, uh, get the tool, uh, the big, the, the backup tool. He will install the stroke tool now.
the ROV will unlock the, the bolts. Then the stroke tool will push the jumper forward to the exit point. By the way, the centimeters and millimeters really matters here. Then we close the connector. We remove the tool from the first end and we go to the other end to make the connection. Same as what we did in the manifold side, we'll do in the Christmas side, Christmas tree side. The stroke tools will push the jumper and then we'll unscrew the caps same same exactly what happened in the first one there we, we will remove as well the uh, the tool and then we'll remove the dummy and then we'll in, insert the hot tab to do some pressure tests and verify it's a tight connected. You see, guys, this operation in case of the template uh, Christmas tree, how hard it will be to do all of this. That's why we say one of the disadvantage is the uh, it's not ROV friendly, the template manifolds. We'll open the hatch now for the cable trays. And then we'll back the electrical connector, the cable itself. We call this flying lead, electronic flying lead. We'll connect it here in the receptacle. I, I bought the electrical cable in each and every one of this, and then I will close the hatch. By this, we have installed the jumper safely and successfully. So we talk about the first thing was the subsea uh, distribute the subsea production system, and as you can see, I need to control this production system. How am I gonna control this production system? I'm gonna control it through the subsea distribution system. Going to control it electrically, hydraulically, some chemical injections. How to do that? By this system. So it consists of a group of products that provide a communication between subsea controls and topside controls 
for all the equipment via umbilical system. So it's mainly the building blocks of the subsea distribution system consist of the following. Subsea distribution assembly, umbilical termination assembly, and the umbilical system. The subsea distribution assembly distributes the hydraulic sub supplies, electrical power supplies, single si signals, and injection chemicals to the subsea facility. As we talk always, the access of the ROV to the, the SDA is should be quite carefully considered because it's a very, very, very important. This is the size of the SDA, so you can imagine uh, the, the way that we how we can operate this is a, a guy and this is one sda will be installed the uta is umbilical termination assembly there is two types of this subsea umbilical temperation assembly and top side the subsea is the one installed in the seabed the other one is the other control part which will be in the platform it could be in the facility it can be anywhere, not in the subsea. So the terminate, terminate umbilical lines and provide one or more connection for hydraulic, chemicals, electrical, and fiber optic services. So it's terminate the umbilical. The umbilical is come to this void and then being terminated to hydraulic, electrical, chemical, and fiber optics. And each and every one of this is run by Flying leads, hydraulic or electrical flying leads. The umbilicals. What is the umbilicals? The umbilical is a group of electric and or optical cables, plastic hoses, steel tubes, either on their own or in combination with each other. And they are cabled together for flexibility, over sheathed and aromed. Sometimes this is required and sometimes not for mechanical strengths and physical characteristics. So actually the umbilical system is combine what you need in the distribution system and transfer it from the shore line, from the shore till the subsea system. And by the way, it's a very, very, very expensive uh, items. One kilo of this umbilical could cost you a lot of money. So it should consider and calculate it well, the lenses you need, what you actually need, and all of this stuff. And it's not standard. It, it's different from company to other. So what the umbilical does for us, it supplies the hydraulic fluid pressure for bulk equitation, and it supplies electrical power to control module it provides control uh, system signals. It provides a link to and from control system. It injects chemicals into Christmas tree and flow lines. It allows venting for the flow line. As I told you, it's not standard. Every company has is, uh, their own standards, and they decide uh, in the design phase what they really need from the umbilical. But this is the most the three common one is the hybrid umbilical, the un uh, the steel tube umbilical, and the large bore tube umbilical. This is the most three common umbilicals used in our industry. But uh, again, each and every company can use uh, can use uh, their own. Uh, ways to create the umbilical that they need. Okay, so now we talk about the subsea operation production system, and we talk about the subsea distribution system. We put this together and we imagine the first thing we talk about is the feed layout. So we have the building blocks, which is contain the four types, the cluster, the template, the daisy chain, and the satellite wells, and we have this distribution system as a feeding system and controlling in this to, to do the golden rule. We need to transfer our production, whether it's oil and gas, safely to the shore. So by this, we can, by this production system and distribution system, we can transfer it safely. This is what we know or how we can do it with the subsea operation. 
So we'll not talk about the whole subsea operation, like we'll not talk about the control part of the subsea operation. We we'll just talk about the intervention part of the subsea operation. The term subsea intervention refers to all the activities to be carried subsea, and it's divided into two main types. Planned intervention, which is the inspection, maintenance, and repair, and it's common with the IMR. Unplanned intervention, we call it emergency response. I need to shut this valve down immediately. I need to do some downline operation immediately. So when you build up the philosophy of the intervention, it should consider three things. What the kind of tasks you will be will be done in the subsea, what the message we will use to complete this job, and what are the requirements to complete this intervention activity. So, again, this is the main concern of the subsea operation is safely produced gas and maintain the asset for the whole design life. So I need to, to say produce gas. So we do something called integrity management plan. I'll do the inspection or the uh, condition monitoring, testing, preventing, preventive maintenance. And then I'll do fitness for service when I receive the data uh, outcome of this. When I do the fitness of service exercise, whether it pass or fail, if it pass, I need to do the preventive maintenance. If it fail, I need to do the repair. Then inspection. Why we inspect the guys? If anyone think about something, why what we why we inspect? We pay money for it's non related it's non related production activity, so it, it doesn't affect your production. So why we inspect? You have extra money. Actually, we have many aspects uh, that require us to inspect and go look at our assets regularly. First thing, legal requirements. In some countries. It's mandatory to inspect, and it's written in the, the codes of the country itself that when you inspect and what you inspect, insurance purposes, of course, the insurance company put, you, put on you some liabilities to do the inspection. I need to protect my asset. If I have a small problem, I fix it immediately, so it's not a huge problem. As well, to minimize the production loss, if I have rapture or failure, will stop my production so I need to minimize this production loss as well to highlight the potential problem earlier and to assess the known or existing problems to know the development of this. How do we inspect? All the structure is setting on the seabed for adepts by thousands of meters. How do I inspect? cannot go and do walk through like what we do in onshore and look at the structure. No, I cannot do that. So actually we have four tools or four methods to inspect, whether to use the divers, ROVs, AUVs, or surveillance. The divers, it's the normal diving we all know, but this is industrial divers. It's a little bit different from the, co the commercial diver. You do the scuba diving and this stuff. So the divers allow you to do a visual inspection, whether it's a general visual inspection or close visual, in, visual inspection. And it allow you to do non-destructive tests techniques, as this picture. And the ROVs is the remote operating vehicle. It allow you to do visual inspection. It allow you to do NDT techniques. It allow you to do survey sensors. You can put some survey sensor, acoustic sensors to get some data. The AUVs is the autonomous underwater vehicle. It's, it's a small vehicle, but it's not controlled by, like the ROV. Uh, it can, you can put cameras and you can put survey sensor, but you cannot, it, it doesn't have arm to do uh, some uh, uh, NDTs. So we do it only by the AUVs some uh, visual inspection and we put some survey sensor. The surveillance, the, it's a continuous and tar target monitoring. When I install the Christmas tree, I install a camera and this camera is sitting there forever, monitoring this forever. This is another way of 
uh, inspection. So the inspection and monitoring techniques is visual inspection, as we mentioned before. I need to look at this, see visually if there is any cracks, if there is any, uh, the, the amount of marine grass, uh, all the, the type of the visual inspection. The non-destructive test, I need to do cathodic protection reading, I need to do ultrasonic reading to, to check the wall thickness and does it wear or not. Uh, strain measurements, I need to check the pressure, the temperature to get the strain measurement the acoustic emissions. Um, we call it the bat technology. It's like a bat throwing some sounds and every single item on the earth have a different frequency responding to this sound wave. So it's reflected with a different frequency. So I have a receiver to receive this signals and transfer it to a shape. This is could give you topography of the seabed. It could give you the internal uh, uh, internal profile of your pipelines. It can give you uh, 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 some uh, ideas about uh, uh, the pipe uh, case uh, or the pipe phase. Uh, you can use it in many things. You can you can, it can tell you what the chemical composition of your pipeline. You can use use it in many many applications. In the picture here is the. Uh, uh, CP, you can see the ROV arm is holding the CP probe and is trying to take a flange. And if you try to do a visual inspection, I can see here the bolts and uh, nuts are well tightened, then it's okay. But I, I can see here an abrasion mark. Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, so this is the mean of the inspection and how we do it. Uh, we're running out of time, so I'll try to uh, go faster. The subsea maintenance, the second item of the IMR, is the subs is uh, the subsea maintenance plan should be built up based on the following: cost, risk, preventation, desired outcome, and return on investment. Uh, most of the maintenance activities can be grouped as follow: cathodic protection system, production system, pipeline and, ri rise and riser, foundation, subsea posting equipment, and subsea separation and treatment equipment. Usually this is the strategy. It's whether it's reactive, immediate or deferred, preventive, schedule-based, predictive, condition-based monitoring, and reliability-centered maintenance. The subsea repair, the repairs are the mandated when inspection or condition monitoring results indicate that the integrity of the system has been compromised or when called for upon by fitness or services assessment. We have four methods of repair, whether I will do refurbishment uh, or retrofitting, patch or replacement, like I have anodes, this anode is already uh, Weird, I need to replace this anode. I can replace it by a simple one or retrofit another anode set to get the same system, the cathodic protection he needs. The repair process is always damage analysis. I analyze my damage and then I do a repair plan and then I do the repair implementation and then I go and I check the integrity management plan and I update it accordingly. This was the first part of the uh, Subsea operation, which is the intervention. Now we'll talk about the ROV intervention. What is the ROV? It's a remote operating vehicle which used to perform all the subsea intervention activities. Uh, we can divide it into two classes. The ROV can be divided into two classes, work class ROV and an inspection class ROV. I'll try to quickly describe what's the ROV components simply. It's, uh, if you can see here, this is a thrusters to make the ROV flies on the seabed. Here is the two cameras to get to be your eyes under uh, the sea, on, under the, uh, on the seabed. Lights, because after 60 meter, the sunlight is not reaching and we have 24 operations, so you need lights. And then here, two arms, one for grab and one for manipulation. This is seven stroke arm, it gives you seven uh, moves. 
and the other one is a grab grabber arm. R, as you can see here, is umbilical to provide the ROV with uh, electric and hydraulic connection. Uh, so how we handle the ROV, how we launch the ROV from the vessel. We have three ways of handling the ROV, the manual handling, and we do this only with the eyeball. It's a small ROV. It's like three kilo weight, very, very small one. So we handle it manually from the uh, top side of the platform. We can install it to as an eye of us to go down and look at a certain thing. LARS, LARS is, uh, stands for Launch and Recovery System, which is this thing. And here, the last thing is the winch. We can launch the, our ROV with a winch, which is this winch can launch our ROV. So what the use of ROV? As we said, all the intervention on the subsea, we use normally ROV out of or beyond the diver uh, depth or the, the depths that the divers can work in. So we use, we use the ROV in drilling Rec support, in construction support, in the survey and in the inspection, uh, in the planned intervention, unplanned intervention, signed integration, decommission, and repair beyond the diver depth. The ROV here is doing the survey. The ROV here is, is doing some repairs. You do everything with the ROV. Part two of the intervention techniques is the uh, diving intervention. What are the diving tasks? Actually, the diver does everything. You just give uh, appropriate uh, environment to the diver and you transfer him to the subsea. He can do some hand tools, rigging, cutting, welding, bolting, everything. Uh, welding here is trying here to, to do some bolting, here do some cutting, and, uh, and here uh, do some inspection as well. He can do some GPI inspection by hand tools, do some NDT testing uh, by carrying these tools. So the divers do does everything. But why we, we we go to the ROV? Because two things. Diving, the most critical operation you will have in the subsea. It's actually operation involves people life. You cannot do diving unless you really need it. Uh, this is the first thing that makes us to go to the ROV less risky to use the ROV. And the second thing is we have a limitation because we are human beings. We have a limitation to do the diving to a certain depth. If I have more depths, I need ROV. As simple as that. So the main two types of the, the diving is the air diving, which is industrial diving with not more than 65 meter depths. You see, guys? 65 meter, you cannot dive. Uh, furthermore, uh, you need deck space not less than 150 meter to 100 meter to install the diving spread. At this time, you're breathing the divers breathing air or nitrogen, and he cannot stay uh, at the subsea for more than four hours. Four hours is your maximum time and you should recover this diver and uh, 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 launch another one. This is the control room. The diver is having above his head uh, a hat and there is a camera mounted on this hat. So the diver, this, uh, just one second, this diver supervisor can see exactly what this diver uh, does in the field and give him uh, instruction. And this guy is very important, guys, because sometimes the diver with a move can put the umbilical uh, around his hand and the umbilical cannot be uh, recovered easily. So this guy is the one who gave him the direction, go left, go right, go up, go down, tilt your head so we can see the picture. And this is, is the decompression chamber. When we have this diver recovered from the seabed, he cannot breathe the air directly. So we place him in a decompression chamber for a certain time. By this decompression chamber, uh, we, we're trying to normalize uh, his lung and back it, make it back to work in the normal uh, atmospheric pressure. This is the launching uh, techniques of the divers. We called it the Golden Gate, and it's a huge topic to talk about it. Just uh, I'm giving you uh, a snapshots about it. 
The second way of diving is more dangerous, but it's more work effective. We call it saturation diving. In this diving, we're not breathing air or nitrogen, we're breathing mixed gases. And this mix is helium and oxygen. So we replace all the nitrogen in the air with the helium and oxygen. And this is, can extend the depths that we can dive to till 350 meters. And uh, th there is no limitation to be on the seabed because actually from the beginning of the job, we bought you in these capsules and we pressurize this capsule to the same pressure that you will be working on as a diver. And you uh, stay in this capsule for as long as the job is. Is the job 30 days, 40 days, 20 days, 15 days, you'll be in this capsule. And then we have one divers on the seabed in this capsule as well. You go do your task and back, and that's it for the end of the job. Uh, this is the control room, and it's same, but it's more advanced because you need to take care more about the amount of the mixed gases and uh, uh, this uh, stuff. Uh, and you need to take care of the people in the capsule. So you are not only watching the people that will perform the work, you are watching the other divers stayed in the capsules. As I said again, it's a very dangerous work. So uh, this is our the ROV operation and the, the subsea operation in general. And uh, now we know what's the field layout, how we build the blocks, what the shape of these blocks, and know what the blocks is, what the subsea production system is, and what the subsea distribution is. And then what's the IMR, the inspection, maintenance, repair techniques, what the subsea operation, what is the diving techniques, and what is the ROV, and how we gonna use this uh, techniques on the subsea. So now let's talk about where are we and where we are going in the future. <coughs> so this graph show you by time starting from 1949 till 2004 and the depths from zero to 2,500 meter depth. And it show you that we have been grown up till 2004 to reach this limit, to, to drill well at 2,500 meter. Uh, the subsea equipment and pipeline riser could collapse due to the pressure uh, material over the depths and it will yield under their own weight. So to reach this point, we need to uh, do some advanced studies to have ROV that can work on that depth, and we need to have some subsea structure that can withstand this pressure and some pipeline that can withstand this pressure. So last thing is last year, we have it here in Oman and India is 3,500 meter. And I can tell you guys, our tools now can reach this depth as ROV, as a sensors, as everything. What we are looking now in India we are looking now in a field at 5,400 meters. So we need to upgrade all of ROVs, all of the subsea structure, the pipeline material need to be changed, the technologies used need to be changed. So as you can see, it's a grown-up uh, science and it's, it's going for more depths and search it for more depths. Uh, that's it for my side. Um, Quite happy to answer two or three questions because we are running out of time. We are exceeding the time by 15 minutes. Thank you so much for your listening. And I wish it, uh, it was a useful presentation and you get benefiting out of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we all would like to thank you, Engineer Mustafa, for the amazing webinar you presented today. We have received many questions, but I have collected the most important ones. Uh, the first question is, under what conditions do we use wet or dry tree methods? Just one second. Under what condition we use the dry or the wet tree? It depends tree. on the customer. Yeah. It depends on the customer preferences and it depends on the depths. If you have it in the near shore, like the depths is 10 meter, 20 meter, no need to order 
uh, at expensive sub subsea Christmas tree to put it there. So it's better to have a risers to connect the wellhead directly to the Christmas tree. Uh, uh, and if it's you need more, uh, or the, you have more depths, you can use the dry, uh, the wet one. So you, uh, we can summarize this by saying it depends on the depth. What is the depth that you are operating? It depends from where are you close to the shore. Do you have uh, offshore installation to put your uh, tree on or not? So cost, depth, and uh, existing facility and customer preferences. This is all the conditions. Thank you so much for the answer. And the second question and the last, what is the differences between satellite and the cluster layout? Yeah, the satellite is uh, well, two wells uh, separately, but they are relatively uh, away from each other. So we do the well and then the jumper and the plate. Uh, and every one of them having a, se a separate feeding system, separate electric, hydraulic system. The cluster, the two wells is separate, but they are close to each other. So it allow me as a developer or a field developer to uh, inject them by only one, uh, uh, one feeding system. Thank you for the answer. And I have another question, uh, if you don't mind. How, yeah, of course. How to ensure how to ensure that there the is rest no of the question. sorry Muhammad yeah. you can send me the rest of the question uh, in my email address I can answer it for all and I can forward it for you you can forward it for the audience okay thank you so much we will try to do that okay. thank you thank you so much uh, the, what was uh, the Mustafa. excuse me what was your question uh, the, the question was how to ensure that there is no leak within the connection spool and jumpers uh, in the pipeline okay uh, when you we have two two ways of uh, ensuring that first we do test on the yard before go and install them we pressurize this jumper or pipeline uh, we do this and after you do your system and you close it and you seal it and you do everything you do uh, something called the hydro test you put uh, pressure pressurized water inside the system and then check you go to the bulb and close it and you have a receiver bulb so you close the other bulb and you you get the reading of the pressure if the pressure is not changing that's mean your system is 100 percent okay thank you so much uh thank you so much engineer mustafa for uh presenting the amazing webinar today Thank you so much, guys, uh, for attending the lecture, and see you in the next uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you, Engineer Ahmed. Have a nice day, all of you. Thank you.